I'm Peter Hawley, and welcome to the podcast, Teaching in the Arts. Glad you could be here for the very first one. Bill Bacon is my guest. Bill is head of the post-production department at Tribeca Flashpoint College. He also taught at DePaul University. He's professionally, he's worked for HBO as a post-production supervisor and for Harpo Productions as a post-production supervisor. So the next president of the United States, Oprah Winfrey, was once Bill's boss. We will talk about all that and the film he's making on teaching. That's what we do here on Teaching in the Arts. I bring in a teacher and we talk about stuff, classes, what's new, the world as a whole, and of course, kids today. But before we get to the guests, I'd like to start these podcasts with a little story from my experience as a teacher. When I graduated from college in 1986, I was one of the most decorated college film students entering the workforce that year. I'd won a Student Emmy Award for a music video I produced and a short film I directed was in a lot of film festivals. I entered the real world bright-eyed and eager. Then almost immediately I learned I could not nor would not be hired by anybody to be a filmmaker. The gap between student filmmaking and professional filmmaking is massive, and I wasn't prepared to bridge that gap. Stymied, I took a job working in the archives of the Museum of Broadcast Communication and went home every night and wrote a script. It took several years, but that script got produced. I got writer and director credit, and now five years after graduation, I was a professional filmmaker. And I've been one ever since. In 1996, I started teaching in the film department at Columbia College in Chicago. I knew I didn't want to have my students graduate and face the same dilemma. I wanted to make sure they were prepared to become professional filmmakers. So I regularly tried to give students opportunities to do professional quality work. I brought in clients from the outside. I had students find clients, restaurants who needed TV or web commercials. I brought other professionals into the classroom to work as their mentors. And so for the past 22 years, I've worked in academia, first at Columbia College Chicago, then as one of the founding faculty at Tribeca Flashpoint College, and then at Columbia College Hollywood. While teaching, I've continued as a filmmaker, making TV commercials, documentaries, music videos, corporate work. My work as a filmmaker informs my work as a teacher and vice versa. This website, the blog, and the podcast is going to focus on teaching in the arts and being a student in the arts. I will be interviewing teachers in all sorts of artistic fields and talking to students and recent graduates about their experiences and hopes for the future. So there you go. My guest is Bill Bacon, as I said. I've known Bill since 2011. I hired him at Tribeca. I was actually intimidated by his resume before meeting him. He taught at DePaul, worked at HBO and Harpo, made films of Second City. He paints, plays guitar, runs marathons. Who is this guy, I thought. But we met, we hit it off, and he's a great guy. So here now is my conversation with Bill Bacon. Bill Bacon, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks but, for coming. I'm glad to be here. Number one. Yeah. yeah. So you're, uh, you're not going to stink this up, are you? I uh, certainly hope not. No. <laughs> no, not at all. We're going to set the bar very high. Yeah. yeah. So this was the first week of your semester, right? Uh, it is the first week, yeah. The uh, first couple of days. Yeah. What, are you, what are you teaching? Uh, I've got an advanced topics post-production class, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting because it's the first time we're teaching it in its current form. So it's going to be, you know, anytime you teach a class the first time, it's a... Uh, hodgepodge of things that work great and things that you're learning uh, could work better. Um, I've got a couple of advanced classes, a capstone class I just came out of earlier today where we've got some of our seniors that are putting together their capstone project and it's going to be the summation of everything that they've learned at school. And so it's very lively, very exciting, and it's uh, the biggest capstone class we've had. I think there's seven students in there. Good. So it's and it's true seniors, be, like yes. you know, about to graduate, you know, twenty one years old or older, and moving absolutely on. good yeah. for them. What um, uh, what are you cutting on these days? Uh, Premiere. Although I just uh, taught a uh, an avid class uh, last uh, semester, so uh, the advanced post students have got to have avid. They have to, um, especially you know any kind of even uh, mid to large budget projects you're going to run into avid so you can't be serious and professional if you're you're not if you don't know avid you, you know i i'm of the belief and i think you are too is like you know we don't teach them how to edit this program this software it's about concepts and ideas and then right. they can take it i, I had uh, a breakfast with a friend of mine who's a producer at channel 11 a pbs station here last week and he's uh producing this uh, chicago tonight and chicago week in review and uh he's actually cutting something together himself for the 40th anniversary of chicago week in review and he said uh, i asked him what are you cutting on and he said media central 
I said, what the hell is that? And he said, yeah, that's what I say. He said, you know, that's what we use, but you know, all these net studios, I mean, TV stations and stuff use their own proprietary stuff or this other stuff. So there's no way you're teaching a college that's teaching Media Central. They're teaching Premiere. They're teaching Avid, Final Cut. They're, but they're teaching the concepts, right? Right, exactly. Well, it's it's funny how often you will see people will talk about After Effects as if, you know, they want to teach After Effects. They want to learn After Effects. It's a tool. And you can do animation. You can do compositing. You can do title design. And so it's, I find that that is similar with any kind of post-production software. People can get caught up in teaching the software. Yeah. And that's always a tension between teaching the tool itself, uh, which you could probably learn in five days. There are right. condensed courses that will teach you that versus how to use that. So I always try to make it a mix of both of those things yeah. um, because, um, you know, you've got to learn the tools, but you know, it's it's just another language. Yeah. So, uh, and to be able to translate from one language to another is going to be really important. Yeah. So, so this is first week of semester. Me, me too. How many classes are you teaching? The uh, we're doing five now. You're teaching five. Yeah. Oh dear God, I'm yeah. teaching two and I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's um, luckily a few of them are um, you know uh, there's a internship independent that studies I have. or so, yeah internship yeah right? and <laughs> so uh, there's one of those so that makes it a little bit easier but um, but yeah five classes it's um, that's kind of what we've been doing for a while now although we split it up. Three classes, then two yeah. classes over fifteen weeks. Before now, it's five for a full fifteen weeks. Uh, I'm tired for you. Yes, you know it hasn't I, actually been that bad uh, so far. But you know, we're here in January. It's dark. It's cold. I mean, it's a uh, the thing about the spring term is you know it does get lighter and warmer, and it's like it's more calendar days between January fifteenth or sixteenth and May when the term is over than it is between Labor Day and and Christmas break. Right, but. It goes so much faster, it seems, partly yeah. because everyone's been in school already and it gets lighter and it's warmer and stuff like that. But the first week of any term is just so damn hard. You don't know the students' names. Like right. I've, I've got right now, I've got uh, 35, 50, I've got 50 students in my two classes and I know five names. You know, I've had right. I've had two classes, but I mean, it's hard when they don't know you, you don't know them. They, right. you, you make a joke and it's sarcasm, but it's not, or it's hard, right. you know. So 25 a class? Roughly, no, or? no, I have one class, which is lecture-based uh uh, a new media and communication class, and that's 35. It's mostly lecture, though. Wow. The students are making their own podcasts or websites. I, I make them do their own solo project and then a group project. And then I've got an intro to production class. Right. 35 is a lot. 35 is a, a lot. In a production class, that's but, really hard. So it's not it's not production per se with cameras and stuff like that. They are, they are, it's a, it's a intermediate class, and they all have some production skills, but they have to create their own project. So right. I'm having them do a blog, a podcast, uh, uh, some a vlog, something like that. Right. And they have to do it consistent. And this was class two, and we actually went over it in great detail today. But, uh, you know, we'll see what, how it so turns when out. when you look at their work, um, you're going to get to everybody's work for every yeah. project. Yeah. And that's that's really hard it, with that many people. Well, you know, so, so I have them, they're going to present to the class in a couple of weeks, uh, the pitch, the idea. This is mm -hmm. what I want to do. I want to do a podcast about teaching in the arts, and it's going to be sort of like this thing, like Mark Maron's thing mm -hmm. or something like that, and I'm going to bring in a person in very specific. And I, I have to, I said they have to be consistent about it, so that I want them to do 10 between... Uh, the first of March and, and May. So I want them to do 10 things. So it's kind of once a week, you know. Right. And and, and so they're going to present it and, and show us some examples. And then starting the first of March, they're going to show us the first one and then they're going to build from there. And like I showed them today, like there's some vlogs, which are simple. It's just like a web camera and, and they're talking. But if there's content is good, you know, I want them, you know, you've heard me talk about the idea of a thousand true fans. Yeah. And like, I believe that everyone in that room and everybody has a thousand true fans that they just think that this is, you know, I like this thing and you're going to like this thing and just sharing that. So yeah. that's sort of my goal. Of this that's class. actually kept me going a couple of times when I think about that, that there's somebody out there that's interested in your work or yeah. I, I, I share that with students all the time is that, you know, somebody is going to like what you're doing. It's, you know, it may not be millions, but it's, you know, or hundreds. A thousand, you know, you know? Yeah. And, and, and especially and now. And that's enough. You know? and, and in the internet age, you know, you, you've got this world where, you know, you don't have to get, you know, a million hits, a million views would cancel any TV show. Right. You know, if right. only a million people watch it, but a million people watch you do your thing, you're a star. Right. You know, and and especially that's we'll talk about it in a bit. I mean, like what students are looking for. I mean, I know when we went to college, everyone wanted to be a director. Right. Right. But now I think it's different. But let's let's we'll get to that in a minute. Sure. So, do you remember when we met? Um, I remember. Yes, absolutely. I remember the first phone call. 
What was the first phone call? Um, I found out um, Harpo was finishing up the Oprah Winfrey show and I was working there. And right as that was starting to finish up, I uh, I was aware of Tribeca Flashpoint and I understood through a friend that there were, they were looking for teachers and uh, there were some possibilities there uh, through Jeff Kleiman. Mm-hmm. And uh, we talked and we had a great conversation. I felt like- You, I, you and me. Yes. Yeah. And I felt like, oh, I have the job immediately. <laughs> And then you backtracked two days later, and I said, we had a nice conversation, but I didn't offer you the job. I just want to be really clear yeah. about that. And I was like, oh, oh okay. Um, but I still felt pretty good. But the funniest thing for me was when I had to apply online, it was through Media Match or some website uh-huh. that I'd never been on before. And it was a, uh, at the time, it was a clunky website. And so I felt like I had everything but the job. If I didn't do the website the right way, if I didn't fill it out the right way, it was all, all over. So that was that was kind of uh, funny, and we were also going on vacation two days later, yeah. I think. And so I there was a deadline there. It was right I, around August first. I think. So, so I remember none of that except that you were going on vacation. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So here's what I remember: uh, I remember getting your resume, and I remember, uh, you know, UCLA, very cool. You right. know, uh, masters from University of Chicago, equally cool, but right. not an MFA. And we're going to talk about MFA right. in a little bit too. And you had taught it to Paul. Excellent. And I was really at that time looking for someone who could teach a business of film class. Uh, we had lost that teacher and anyone who could teach post was going to be a bonus, even though I, you know, I really wanted both people and you were kind of the perfect fit that way you right. were teaching this business of film class. And then, and then you had this, this editing thing, but I got your, your resume and you had HBO and you had Harpo and the stuff I remember was painting, guitar playing, marathon running. Yeah. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, why does he want this job? Right. You know, why are you leaving leaving Oprah to 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 come here and, and do this? But that was what I remember. And then and then I remember when you came in. I don't remember the phone call. I remember mm-hmm. you coming in and doing the teach in. And you did a fine, really fine job doing that. And we had the the little lunch, which I think is actually more important for me to see if we get along, just you and the other faculty talking, kibitzing. Right, right. Are you one of us? We're going to work really hard. And uh, and and then you and I met after your teaching. I felt really, really good about it. And then a couple of days later, I got a card, postcard from you. Right. And you had sent me a card from O'Hare. Uh, exactly. Saying, you know, congratulating me on the Boston Red Sox yeah. <laughs> and saying nice meeting and stuff like that. So that immediately put you at the top of my list. Well, that was funny too, because I was going to mention that I remember as we were heading out that I was writing the thank you notes as we were waiting to, you know, in the jetway to take off. And it's like, where is there a mailbox at O'Hare? And there is one. Um, but I wanted to get those out, you know, before, so I could just put that behind me, yeah. whatever happened, happened, and we can enjoy Colorado, and it was going to be great, and it was. Um, but, yeah, that's I think that's really important, and, and that kind of thing I always impress upon my students. It will just put you ahead uh, even a little bit, and that's what you need is a, is any kind of edge. Yeah, of yeah. And, and and we had a personal connection, and mm-hmm. the Red Sox thing was a, was a really good thing. I mean, honestly, I mean, when I saw your resume, I'm like, wow, at least if this guy can walk and talk and we can have lunch and he you know doesn't drool, right. you know, I think you've probably I got the job. I do occasionally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the Red Sox was kind of sucking of up. Of course. But, you know, but, yeah. you know. Well, it was professional. I, I was so. the boss. I don't mind being sucked right, up to right. you. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. So, so, but before that, so let, let's go way back. So, you're from Chicago, right? You're in the uh, Chicago suburbs, area. yeah. Yeah. So, what's your background? I mean, sister, I know, but what, what do your parents do? Um, um, my dad um, got into uh, illustration and design um, very early on. And I don't, it's, it's interesting. I think he just picked it up. He liked cartooning very early on. So he was an illustrator himself? Yeah. And, wow. yeah. and he actually, um, he went out to California and um, was there for a brief time because uh, he came back because he had a job offer, hard job offer here in Chicago. But he went out and he was thinking about going to work for Disney and trying to do that. Uh, he went out there with a friend of his, and I think they ran into it during a strike or something. There was something that was kind of in the way of, you know, them thinking that it might be a good idea to stay out there for a while. And then they got this job offer in Chicago, and so the story is they drove overnight, you know, two <laughs> nights back to Chicago and, and got the job. And that's how he ended up here, ended up meeting my mom, all of that. But um, So he did a lot of um, graphic design, and there were always – typography books and design books and photography books around all the time. So we just grew up with that hmm. uh, all around. Um, on the other hand, my mom also was 
Uh, she worked at the library, and she's an excellent writer, and she, there was always books around, and she loved uh, movies, her and her brothers and sisters, like all the old-time movies. So I think uh, – and then one of her brothers, uh, my uncle Jim, was a photographer, and so he had cameras around. He worked at a camera store. So this kind of combination of things – made it almost inevitable that I was going to be interested in film in some way. Hmm. I mean, I distinctly remember my dad had this thing in the garage that was called a splicer. I had no <laughs> idea. It was such a strange word. And, um, you know, so we had the home movies and I started out with Super 8 and all of that. But I, I would draw a lot. And at one point I wanted to be an architect because I, you know, loved the design mm -hmm. aspects of that. Um, but I think it was kind of inevitable that I was going to move towards filmmaking in some way. Huh. Uh, at least as part of my whole artistic background. What, I mean, what what kind of films early on you, you, were you watching or you were shown that you like went, wow, that's that's something beyond just Wonderful World of Disney on Sunday nights right. on TV? You know? Well, what was interesting was that when I first started noticing movies, um, there was a movie that I loved. There was a TV movie called Duel. And... Uh, <laughs> And, by, by a guy named Steven Spielberg. <laughs> well, I didn't know at that time that that was uh, anybody. Of course, yeah. And um, and then I saw another, I forget what the other movies were, and then I started realizing that his name kept popping up in all these movies that I thought were pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And it sounds a little bit, um, you know, it's it's an easy choice now, but at the time it was very exciting and you had movies like The Godfather. And I remember <laughs> uh, when my parents went to see The Exorcist, I was too young to see mm -hmm. The Exorcist, but when they came back and their reaction, I was like intrigued by it. Uh -huh. Um, so those were kind of the movies that really got me going. I really liked the old war movies like The Longest Day and um, A Bridge sure. Too Far came out. I really – that was a yeah. huge yeah, kind yeah. of old school war movie with all the big stars. stars. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So those were things that I thought it was uh, – would be cool to make uh, yeah. on some level. What, so. what about television? Were you informed by television at all? Um, Yes, but what what was it? I well, because you mentioned you know Duel and Dennis Weaver and Duel. Right. So when I think of Dennis Weaver, I think of McLeod. I, I like yeah. loved like the NBC Sunday Mystery, and it was McLeod and McMillan and wife and Colombo. Sure. I mean, I, I saw movies, but the movies I saw were like with my grandmother. I saw Disney films. Right. Uh, I mean, like the great Disney films, like the animated stuff, Snow White, and those right. films. Um, and then I saw – my parents would take me to films. I remember going to, with them to like The Sting, seeing The Sting sure. when The Sting came yeah, out. Yeah, we saw that. Yeah, It was great. I, and uh, the Pink Panther movies with Peter sure. Sellers and a few of the other ones too. And we always really loved it. My dad was a big fan of like the Marx Brothers and stuff. But, but for me, like movies was like a thing – sort of far away. Te right. Television was just more accessible to me. Yeah. Um, what I do remember is the uh, there was a Saturday Night lineup where you would have Carol Burnett. Oh, of course. And then um, I forget what, um, yeah. I don't know if All, all in the, in the family. family was yeah. on, and Marriage Had a Moore, and Bob right. Newhart. Oh, fantastic. And right. it was funny because All in the Family came up in class not too long ago, and I was just asking, have you guys heard of this? And they <laughs> sort of have. And I'd be curious how those episodes hold up now. Um, well, you know, given they how hold things up. Are. I, I watch from time to time. Yeah. They hold up because they would sit there and they would never be on television today. Right. I mean, they well, are. see, that's the other thing. That, right? They would just not make broadcast television and they probably wouldn't make cable television because they are so in your face. There's a lot of yelling and screaming. There's a lot of, you know, uh, sexism, racism, uh, religious, you know, complaints. I mean, right, right. You know, complaining. Archie, Archie was just a horrible character, but it was a great character for the time, I think. But it's very in your face, and then it's also done in such a uh, theater type format. You know, you've oh, got that, you're, you're only in their living room, maybe in their kitchen, right? And 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 the camera's just there. I mean, it's like sparse. I mean, it's like you we we're not used to that it's now. very much like a stage play yeah and you know um funny though the, man yeah and carol carol o'connor and rob reiner and gene stapleton those and 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 uh uh gloria i'm blanking her name the second but i mean Sally Sally Struthers. Struthers. Yeah. i mean they were great as an ensemble yeah. but carol o'connor was terrific oh, and yeah. rob reiner as a kid was terrific yeah absolutely yeah. um then you know this saturday night live when that was a uh, new thing yeah um, I had really gotten in again through my uncle. I had discovered National Lampoon magazine and it was – I'd read Mad Magazine as a kid too. But this seemed like grown up and it seemed really kind of dangerous almost. Yeah, and my sure. mom forbade me to read it <laughs> and um, eventually they would pick up a copy for me because I over time kind of, you know, talked them into it. But a lot of that really informed uh, what I was thinking because it felt like – you know, the older kids, you know, and they were causing yeah. trouble. And yeah, that was, yeah. you know, what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, along with Saturday Night Live in the early days was um, 
uh, just fantastic. And I remember at the first time they were advertising the show with George Carlin, the first mm -hmm. episode. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm dating myself a little bit. But um, I also remember distinctly when – uh, they ha got this new guy to replace Chevy Chase that I was, I'm like, so upset. And I'm yeah. like, who's this Bill Murray guy? Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. With a mustache. Yeah. <laughs> and he slowly won us over. So oh, my. I mean, yeah. Saturday Night Live was great. And, and you know, you had an advantage that I didn't have because at that time I was living on the Eastern Time Zone. So it started at 1130. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, I'm, you know, what, 12, 13, 14 years old, you know, right in that. And like, I was pushing the boundaries of staying up late. At right, that point. exactly. But here, when we moved to Chicago, it's on at 1030, and like, you can watch it. That always fascinated me, too. Like, you mean, there's people that are watching the news at 11? Yeah. Or it's, it, it, everything's different there. And, and Monday Night Football, to yeah. me. I was a sports fan. It was like, Monday Night Football, as a kid in the Eastern Time Zone, started at 9. Right. Like, that's crazy late. And when I lived in California, it was amazing to see it come it's on six, at dinner time. Or, or, know, or, or the early football game starting at 10 in the morning. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, yeah, it was kind of cool, actually. Yeah. That was one of the good things about California. So so how did... So you went to high school here in the Chicago area. Downers North. Okay. Yeah, Downers and Golden then you North. went to UCLA. Yeah. I mean, that's great. But why UCLA? What's the process? I mean, I don't know anybody from Chicago in the late 70s, early 80s who was going to California for, for art schools. I mean, film school stuff, Yeah, you know? Um, I looked at SIU. I looked at Columbia. Um, so those were all positive. I actually went to junior college for a year and a half uh, here getting ready to well, you know, that, get Well, that helped credits. you yeah. getting in. And, and then there. I went to uh, U of I in Champaign for a year because I wanted to go to a big school before I made the move out there. So it was a, uh, not a straight path out there, but... Um, I kind of got it in my mind. That's where I wanted to be. And the the reason it probably happened was because my dad had gone out there and it was always in the air. And my I had uh, my aunt and uncle lived uh, out there. L.A. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So and uh, we had visited a couple of times. So it wasn't as exotic or I mean, it was exotic, but it wasn't super foreign to me. Um, and I'd looked at USC, but I knew that, you know, being a private school, that was going to be, you know, tougher. And I think it was to my advantage that I applied to UCLA as a transfer student because yeah. I was – it was more unusual. So. Yeah. And I had good grades by that point too. So So did you go in as a junior? Or yeah, did you, junior. Oh, so yeah. you were actually having an associate's degree and then you transferred in? I uh, did not have an associate's degree. But you had degree, close. But, yeah. yeah, enough credits. Yeah, I didn't. So, so what were – when you got to UCLA, what were some of your influences, both teachers or films or other students? What what sort of pushed you and said, I want to do this thing? Or I mean, it's a whole different world. I mean, right. it becomes – even in the 80s, it's competitive. Right. You know, it's a different kind you – know, people there are looking at going into Hollywood. They're not right. looking at going to be a teacher. Right. They're not looking at doing post-production. They probably were what I was saying earlier – wanted to direct. Right. You know, what what was what was happening for you when you were there? Well, it was interesting because I think for the first year and a half or maybe even longer, I was just, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what it was like to be out there. And there were so many people that were do doing interesting things. And I was still really immature. I mean, as far as the <laughs> world goes. I can't imagine Bill Bacon being immature. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You're not a prankster. Yeah. Well, you weren't a frat boy. I it, can't imagine that. Well, no. There's, <laughs> it's funny. I look back and it's, I recognize myself a little bit uh, back then, but it's, you know, a lot changed. And I think, um, you know, you would be in class with people like um, Alexander Payne was there. Huh. Um, he was a graduate student. So we didn't, I mean, we were in adjoining editing rooms and we would talk and all that, but we weren't real friends or anything like that, but we knew of each other and all that. So being around people that were really talented and um, just, you know, com coming from different backgrounds, one of the things that sticks out to and me- And Alexander Payne's from Nebraska. Yeah. I mean, yeah. another sort of West Coast, Midwestern transplant yeah. to, to California, that's cool. And I get, but it was, what was interesting, I think he had gone to Stanford for his oh. undergrad and he had like, Spanish degrees and all that. <laughs> and so that to me was one of the biggest influences was just being around people from all these different yeah. backgrounds. And strangely enough, one of the things that sticks out to me is they used to have uh, all the clubs uh, along. Uh, uh, no, I, the actually the school clubs. <laughs> See, oh. I, you're the you say you're immature. Right. And my my head immediately goes to Whiskey rock clubs. Go -go, right? <laughs> of course, right. So <laughs> nerd, you, nerd clubs is yeah. what you're talking about. Okay. So. Um, you know, all of these different organizations. Yeah. And the one that always stuck out to me was La Raza. And for some reason- It's not it's, a coffee thing? It's not like, no, it was- La Vaza. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the Latino organization. And one of their points that stuck out to me was they wanted to reclaim California. I mean, it was like this radical thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what <clears> is that all about? And it was nothing that I ever really followed up on or whatever. And I thought that's kind of crazy. But 
I really started to realize there was so much more out there than, you know, movies and all of that. So it's not that I didn't, um, that, that I didn't enjoy my time or, or whatever, but it was just, it was so expansive, you know, it expanded my mind in a lot of ways, I so, think. So you said, you know, you talked about Alexander Payne and right. being with these other creative people in the other editing rooms around, you know, what's interesting is you're not telling me you, maybe you will, but you're not telling me you had this great teacher. This guy blew your mind or something like that. To mm. me, I, I think I've had a combination of really great teachers who've been influential, but also, uh, to me, going to college, the best part of it was being around thousands of other 20 year olds right. and being influenced by them. And sometimes it was records or art or anything. I mean, I've seen um, uh, blow up for the first time because right. a, a, a friend of mine who lived two doors away said, have you seen this? And I've never heard of it. And he said, come, we're screening in my class, come see it. And I went and it was like mind blowing. That that to me is what college is about. Right, right. You know, so so what what about you? Would you have teachers influence or other, other well, students? Yeah. yeah, the first guy that comes to mind was a guy named Howard Suber who taught a uh, film history class. And he just recently retired last couple of years, I think, uh, maybe, you know, five, six years now. Um, but he'd been there for a really long time and he was teaching uh, history of American film and he had been involved in the business. He consulted uh, in the business as well. But just his, um, the breadth of his knowledge uh, really stuck out to me and he was so eloquent the way he was explaining mm -hmm. these concepts that they just kind of, uh, it, it was just a real pleasure there. Um, there was a, I don't know if I ever had her for a class, but there was an, um, a professor named Denise Mann, who I think is still there as of last year. And she's done a lot of work, um, there. So I remember her and she's, uh, gotten uh, very prominent now. What did she teach? Uh, you know, was I it production based or is more theory? I want to say, uh, history as well, but I don't think that's accurate. I, I don't know, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I'd have to look it up. Um, but what you just did trigger was I had a TA. Um, and, um, her name was, uh, Nina Liebman and she was just very nice and she always cared about my work and was always, I could tell she cared about me as a person and was just kind and wonderful. And, and, and she just really stuck out as like, you felt good when you were around her. Mm -hmm. And the last time I saw her, um, I had graduated already. I was still working on campus and we just ran into each other on campus and she was just as remembered me and it was just wonderful. And it's just kind of how a teacher can make an impact on your life. It's just like a wonderful yeah. thing. And this horrible thing happened where apparently um, there was a domestic violence thing and she was killed uh -huh. uh, three or four years later. And she had just written a book about TV in the fifties and the, um, the view of women in TV in the fifties and how they were portrayed. And what a loss. I mean, uh, it's just- What, what was her name? Uh, Nina Liebman. Oh, man. Yeah. And it's it's funny, you know, I'll think about her every now and then sure. and you just triggered that. So, but uh, what she did was she was always very encouraging, even when I didn't feel really encouraged about yeah. my work. It seemed like, you know, there was a possibility that, hey, maybe this, you know, is something- you know, that, that, uh, is worth showing. Well, so. well, I think that's what a good teacher does is they're, they're yeah. part coach, they're part emotional coach, maybe even more emotional coach yeah. than, than button pushing coach, you right. know, and, and, and being there for you. And also, you know, pulling a young person out of their shell, you know, Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I see, and I bet you feel this way too, you know, so many young people, 18, 19, 20 year old college students don't know how to talk to an adult are afraid to talk to an adult or afraid. I was that way, right. you know? I mean, I, a story I, I tell is, you know, I had this um, teacher I was a, a, a teaching assistant for. I was a teaching assistant for him a couple of times and I, um, uh, I, I had his classes a, a bunch of times and I graduated and uh, was looking for a job and, and, and references and stuff like that. And my dad said, uh, you know, contact him, Irv, Irv Rain. And uh, he said, I said, no, I can't do it. He won't remember me. He'll forget me or something like that. And I didn't do it. And uh, about a year later, I'm with my sister. And <laughs> this is probably like 1987. I'm, I'm uh, in a McDonald's in Evanston, Illinois. And, and Irv walks in. And he sees me and he comes right over to me and he goes, Holly, how are you? Where oh, have you fine. been? And I just went, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, I'm like, right, right. why did I do this? And I'm like, why couldn't I? he knew who I was? I knew I'm like, and like, but I was too insecure at, even after right. graduating, after working with this guy. I, I, and that's I think what a lot of people do as teachers, as teaching assistants, as you just described, is to make these young people feel 
comfortable. I mean, if you're going in as a student, if you're going into the arts, it is really scary. Right. You may not think you're scary because you were the best kid in your high school or the best dancer or whatever you are, but then you get into college and now there are people that are coming from all over the country. Right. And they're coming from all, they were the best at all of their places and who are you? And, and oh yeah, you're doing your laundry for the first time and you're living away from home for the first time and balancing your budget and all that kind of stuff. And you just need someone who says, hey, I see something in you, keep doing right, it. Right, you know? exactly. And it sounds like you had that. Yeah, um, so that that was really nice. But you know, it also, um, I had a similar thing where I realized when I, I eventually ended up working at HBO and there was a moment there where I was working with people and I realized that it was okay to be uh, aggressive is not the right word, but uh, very assertive and to really kind of push your agenda. Cause uh, I don't know if I was Midwest nice or whatever, <laughs> but it was, you know, you want to be polite and you want to be a nice person and all that. But there's a, uh, you know, I was introduced to a way of doing business that, you know, you could be a good person, a nice person, and also really assertive in, you know, your job and, and um, you know, uh, negotiating and things like that. And so that was a big part of, uh, you know, growing up out there too, I think. So, so after you graduated, you stayed in LA? I stayed in LA. Yeah. And so, um, go ahead. Um, I, I worked on campus, uh, briefly and then I got an internship, um, where I think I worked 40 straight days trying <laughs> to impress them, um, on a, um, a, a cable show. Um, it was either not necessarily the news or there was a Martin Mull, uh, uh-huh. series for Cinemax. And uh, that's where I met um, uh, this gentleman, Carmi Zlotnick, who uh, was a production manager, but he was a star on the rise. And he ended up going to HBO, and then he brought me over there when uh, when they had an opening. So what would you do at HBO? I was, uh, I guess it would be the equivalent of an office PA. So I was an <laughs> assistant and uh, then generally worked, uh, slowly worked my way up over time to kind of uh, middle, middle management of, you know, um, uh, moving more towards post-production. So overseeing... Uh, kind of a liaison between the home studio office and uh, of HBO and the various post production entities out there doing the shows. So, so, so you weren't cutting. No, I wasn't yeah. doing any of the editing. Right. You, you know? were making sure that the project got through the pipeline and ready for delivery right. and air and all that. Kind exactly. Of stuff. And, exactly. And and the in between between the studio or network and the production house or post production house. Right. Exactly. And yeah. it. I was there, um, I think it ended up being around nine years, and it was great to see the way a studio works from the inside. Sure. And it, especially at that time, what HBO was, they were really taking off yeah. and becoming, uh, you know, a powerhouse. What were some of the shows you were on? Uh, Dream On was one of them. Sure. So that was a comedy. Um, uh, Tales from the Crypt was a big one. Um, Pre-Sex in the City. Yeah. Pre- that was just... Larry David, of course, you know. Yeah, right, he yeah. Uh, he would be around, but, you know, it wasn't Curb Your Enthusiasm yeah, yeah. yet. But um, Sex in the City was in development when I left. Um, my favorite series that I worked on there uh, was called From the Earth to the Moon, and it was a, thir- I think, 13-part series. Tom Hanks? Yeah. Yeah. On the Apollo space missions. Yeah. And I was a huge space sure. freak as a kid. Um, and so I ate that up. And I positioned myself where I could be the head of the research department, all of two people. But, um, <laughs> but I got to I got to go to Houston in the space center there, and we did cool. research. And another part of what I did was finding. This was right after um, they had done Apollo thirteen, mm-hmm. so they did the series after this. Uh, but finding uh, all the mock-ups for the spacecraft, and what was interesting is a lot of the museums had them. Uh, we found the lunar module that would have been flying on Apollo 20 if, wow. they had, if they had flown it. And we used that for the series. And wow. That was very cool. And, you know, going down to the set and meeting Dave Scott, who was the commander, I think, of Apollo 15, that was wow. very cool. And yeah. uh, so that was a lot tw- of fun. There were only 12 guys who walked on the moon. 12 guys. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Exactly. Wow. So that that was a lot of fun. I was, that yeah. was great. So, so, so once you got the HBO gig, that was a full-time job. There yep. was no freelancing, all that kind nope, of stuff. So it. what happened? You got out of there, came back to Chicago. What's the transition? I don't know the story. Yeah. Um, well, I was always working on my own scripts and things, and nothing ever really took off there. And it was, you know, at that point, it was a very different world where it was much more of a kind of a strict hierarchy, the agencies and all of that. And, um, you know, you didn't have, well, you did have cable TV, but you didn't have streaming. And, you know, yeah. things were, DVDs were newish. And, <laughs> uh so it was it was uh, a different a different world, and so from HBO, I went to a smaller independent company that 
both produced films and distributed them. And, um, and it was called uh, Mark Damon Productions or MDP Worldwide was the name of it. And so there I was uh, in charge of routing the, you know, making all the elements for the films that were made, uh, tracking them across the globe, Europe, uh, South America, Asia, hmm. um, because they were trying to save money on film prints. So they would, <laughs> so we would route it from Japan first because they demanded highest quality and we could send it to South America because they thought they could get away with that, you know, <laughs> scratch prints. Germany always gave us a hard time because they were very strict on their standards and they wanted to repurpose their elements themselves and charge us back. So, you know, all of that stuff. It was, um, it was a, a good learning experience. I was there, I think, two years. Uh, but it was a, a difficult place to work, you know, mm. just personalities wise. So mm. I, and, I learned a lot. And then but. you got out of there and came to Chicago. Or yeah, what? and what it what it happened was, um, I had uh, picking up on that thread where I, at, at UCLA I realized there was a lot more to the world than just movies. And and the other thing that I think maybe you can relate to is that when you're in the middle of a business like that. All of my social connections started to be people that were writing scripts, yeah. or, and you get inside this bubble that, yeah. while it's interesting and helpful in some ways, it's really um, mind-numbing in some other ways. And I kind of wanted to get out of that. There was so much more to yeah, explore. Yeah. So, so I started looking at graduate school programs and things that um, I found interesting. And I knew University of Chicago had a master's program that was only a year long, and um, and so I started looking into that. And then when I thought, well. I'm kind of done with this job. Uh, maybe I'll apply and see what I can do and, and uh, you know, see more of my family and, and all of that. And I got in and I came back. And I always thought, you know, it's a year. I can always come back to L.A. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, I did interview uh, a couple of years later. I did interview uh, for a Judd Apatow show ah. uh, before he was Judd Apatow. <laughs> and I think – I don't know what it was called. As what? Doing what? Uh, post supervisor. Uh -huh. And I, I think I was down to the last two or three people. They had called me out. I flew out for an interview. It went great, you wow. know. And um, it, yeah, it just didn't happen. So yeah. that, that's fine. And I, I had a girlfriend out in LA at the time, coincidentally, that I met in Chicago. Yeah. So I would have moved back out there, I think. And uh, but it just it didn't work out that way. So what, what uh, was the grad program? Uh, it's called Master of Arts uh, in the Social Sciences. So essentially, what it is, uh, it's for people that apply to graduate programs at the University of Chicago and don't get in. They put you in this program for a year where you can burnish your resume and then reapply to, you know, some other mm -hmm. highfalutin school and all that. And it's, it's great. I went in um, because I was thinking about uh, pursuing academia in some way because I felt like I had some uh, skills in that way. And I, I, it's kind of the way my mind works. Um, and so I thought I'd try it out. And uh, so I was there for a little bit different purpose. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the people that were applying to PhD programs were kind of in a professional mode. I was kind of in a let's see what this is like mode. Mm -hmm. And I know by the time I was done with that uh, year's program, I was kind of ready to go back to work. I didn't want to go back into academia immediately. Um, and sometimes I think back on that because, you know, that would have been a, a really good launching point. Mm -hmm. But I learned a, a lot about what I was interested in, what I wasn't interested in, and and I learned, you know, what it was like to go to a, you know, a school where the, you know, fairly rigorous yeah. program. So. so you didn't ever think of an MFA program? I didn't because I kind of felt like um, I had done the film thing, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd worked in it long enough yeah. where if I think whenever I think of an MFA program, I would think more broadly and maybe think of like a design program, mm -hmm. you know, something along those lines where I would kind of expand – my base of skills rather than go more deeply because I feel like, at least in my case, that um, I I can get to wherever I want to get in so, the film. I, I agree uh, with you. And yeah. that's why I didn't get an MFA either. Yeah. But, but I mean, that is also a curse of death if you want to go teach in college film programs. Exactly. You know? That's so, that's one of the, the problems, yeah. But you said you, you wanted to, you had this inkling that, you know, teaching or academia was something you were interested in right. or could do at... What, how'd you get that inkling and, and what did you think you were going to teach? You know, that it's really interesting. I guess, I don't know how well thought out it was, but <laughs> um, I had this idea that I, I was really interested in political science. Mm -hmm. um, I was very interested in, um, as it turns out, you know, many of the social sciences, the anthropology aspects of that. Um, but political science was kind of the thing that I was uh, most interested in. Um, and then the more I, I went through that program at University of Chicago, I realized 
I liked the philosophical aspects of all the classes I was taking more than anything mm -hmm. else. It's like, well, why are we think? Why is this a good method to mm -hmm. examine this? What What mm -hmm. does that say about yeah. um, this kind of approach? You know, that yeah. sort of thing. So I started taking more philosophy classes, and um, what I, you know, if I had been aware of it at the time, I think I would have taken more psychology classes because what I I always try to introduce psychology into my classes at Tribeca because especially screenwriting because it's all about sure. character. It's all about what makes people tick. And um, really that's uh, that's the way I kind of introduce those cross-disciplinary type ideas. Well, I mean, cinema film is just completely psychological. Right. I mean, see a Hitchcock film? Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? exactly. Rear, Rear Window, any of those. I mean, it's all, right. it's all that way. Yeah, I completely agree. And Bl speaking of Hitchcock up, yeah. films, there were two films that were made about Hitchcock that I was like, oh, I, I had very low expectations. And uh, I saw one and, and part of the other one. They were both pretty good. There was one with Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that was that was pretty amazing. Just yeah, and, and the other one is uh, when Marilyn Monroe goes uh, to uh, England to be in the Laurence Olivier film. Yeah, that right? could that be film? the one. Well, yeah. and no, no, that's not. Uh, that wouldn't be Hitchcock. No, there was so. the one with. Um, I think it focused on Tippi Hedren. And, yeah, and, right, right, right. And so yeah. it was. Uh, it was fascinating. So anyway, um, have you seen Hitchcock Truffaut? Um, no, I have not the seen a documentary it yet. about yeah, that. Oh yeah. man, that's amazing. I have the book, but yeah. I have not seen the yeah, movie it's, yet. So see it. Yeah. So 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 before we get into teaching, yeah. you, somehow you got the Oprah. Yes. Harpo. How how that happen, and what did you do there? Um, so after I finished graduate school, within a week, I got a job at um, a place called Superior Street sure, Post Production. I remember that, yeah. You remember them? Yeah. And. Um, it was a small post, well, medium-sized post-production house. They did some good work. Ma Maggie was there. Right? Maggie, yeah. 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 And uh, they had five partners. And I said in my interview, the only uh, thing that I uh, am concerned about is I never want to get in between the partners and you know, <laughs> push and pull. And in a way, that's sort of inevitable that there's that that's going to happen. But um, there was um, a Brian Wilson ongoing documentary that right. John, uh, John Anderson, Anderson was, was doing, doing yeah. right? Yeah. And um, – uh, Colin was there, um, and, um, Gary, what's that? Gary? Uh, no, I'm, I'm hmm. blanking on his name now, but he, he has a company called Mode Project now. Hmm. And, um, and, um, so that was really interesting. And that, that was, uh, post-production management again. And, uh, we ended up parting ways, uh, for various reasons after, I think it was a year and a half or two years. And then, um, but one of the things that uh, was a blessing there was that um, uh, Harpo was a client. So when they had overspill uh, at their uh, offices, they would come and, and use uh, our facilities. And that's how I got to know the schedulers huh. there. And, and so when, um, what ended up happening was I left Superior Street, went to go work for a place called Big Idea Productions which was an amazing place. And um, I, was, I was a little bit concerned because the way I, when I did my research, it was basically they do computer animated Bible stories. And I thought there was <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of room for mishaps there. They were the but Veggie Tales people. They were the Veggie Tales people, yeah. And, um, and they were the nicest people. And, um, and they were actually working out of the old Yorktown Mall in, in Downers <laughs> Grove. They had taken the old Woolworths store <laughs> And turned it into like a Disney Studios. It was amazing. And I remember going in uh, for my interview, and there was a table full of people. I mean, it seems like there were 15 people around this table. It was like the whole group seeing if I was, you know, um, you know, somebody <laughs> they wanted to invite into their their club. And uh, they're very all very nice. And um, they asked, "Well, why do I want to come work there?" And the Yorktown Mall was just down the street from where I grew up. And so I. <laughs> thought about it for a second. I said, oh, I'll go for it. And I said, the reason I want to work here is I always dreamed of working at the Yorktown Mall <laughs> when I was growing up and this is my chance. And it went over well and I got the job and it was, uh, it was, it was an amazing place because you would walk down the halls and the concept art on the walls was, uh, you know, a lot of the guys had come from Disney and the work they did was fantastic. Yeah. VeggieTales is a big thing. Yeah. yeah. It was, it, and everybody knows it. Yeah. You know, I'm a even our students now. Really? respond warmly to it you know it's just so it's an amazing thing um and in the production offices they had these gantt charts lined up for like what, 10 no, years. what are those? those are like the project management charts oh. and so 
um, they had, I don't know, 10 or 15 projects, movies and, mm-hmm. and series and TV or videos and all that. And they had plotted this out over, you know, two walls worth of, you know, it was like snaked around the walls for like 10 years. They had this <laughs> master plan. It was amazing. Um, so really good people. I really enjoyed it there. Um, what ended up happening was they ended up not renewing my contract and brought on a guy named Steve Hullfish, who I don't know if you know him, but he's really well known as he's an editor and um, he he's really well known for uh, now. He's written books on Avid hmm. and he does a podcast and interviews called Art of the Cut hmm. and it's put on the Avid blog and he's got a book out and all that uh, called Art of the Cut. So a uh, really good guy. And he had just come from Harpo and had let me know that there was an opening there huh. to fill in for somebody while they were on maternity huh. leave. I went there, got that job and did impress them enough that they kept me on uh, when uh, – when uh, the person returned from hmm. from leave, so what was your job there? Um, I was uh, basically post production supervisor, so scheduling and project management. Um, I actually started out on the motion control stand. You know, I would do <laughs> part of that. You know, shooting still photos. So that was part of it to fill in part of my day, and then you know that got old, and I ended up doing you know the project management. So. Uh, if you were a producer and you'd gone out and shot a package uh, interview and uh, B-roll and all of that, and you came back and you said, I need an editor, I need uh, this much time, I need this, these are my preferred editors, I would then say, well, they're not available, but how about this? Uh. We'd negotiate it and we would schedule it and we would keep track of the um, the uh, work orders and all of that. So it was kind of the nuts and bolts of – both scheduling, routing, project management, and then kind of the cleanup after the jobs were over. Was it a good gig? Uh, it was very good in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. How long were you there? Uh, nine years there wow. as well, yeah. Um, that's a long uh, time. Those yeah. are two, so HBO for nine years? Yeah. And yeah. that's a long chunk, of t- that's a long time to have yeah. a job, yeah. What was, the, the things that were great about <clears throat> it were, um, I think first and foremost, it was very clear that you were working at a major league level. You know, mm-hmm. everybody there was really good at what they did. It was really intense um, in a good way. And what I laugh about now is if there was a computer problem, not only would it be addressed in two minutes, <laughs> uh, it would be solved probably in five minutes. Wow. Um, because there was, you know, always kind of this sword hanging over you. This is the best gig you're going to yeah, get yeah. in town, right? Um, so that you know, they also talked about a culture of fear and and all of that. So it's in any place where there's a lot at stake and people were making decent money there. Yeah. Um, it was very high profile. So there's a lot of, um, you know, human nature comes out <laughs> when, yeah, yeah, when that's course. involved. But what, what it really did teach me too was how to work with people e- even more so, how to say no without ever saying no, um, negotiating all of that. And um, that that was that was ideal. And that, I, I made some really good friends there, too. That, that's really interesting. So HBO, LA and HBO. Right. Then Ve- VeggieTales, I'll call it Big Idea of VeggieTales, mm-hmm. which is, again, reli- conservative, religious. And right. then Oprah, which is conservative in terms of content, I think. You right. Know, though she certainly isn't. Uh, really interesting career. And having a big chunk of time at, at least two of those places. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So so how do you make that transition to, to teach? I mean, wh- when that happened? You well, know? Um, wh- one of the great things about the job was that uh, I often worked a shift that would start at three in the afternoon and go to eleven at night. So mm-hmm. that was that allowed me time yeah. in the early part of the day to either take a class or I uh, I think it was two thousand seven ish. Um, I uh, DePaul started their cinema program. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe it was before that, but I heard they were looking for adjuncts, and I said, "Well, I'm going to give this a shot. Uh, it's something I'd be interested in doing." And my hope was that if I didn't like teaching, at least I'd get better at public speaking. I would be, you know, I would <laughs> Standing up in front of yeah. people and talking, yeah. And I wouldn't, uh, I would, that would be less of a, a, a problem for me. And uh, I ended up liking it. There were things I really liked about Who, it. Who'd you talk to? Matt Irvin was yeah, he over there? Yeah, the, Matt. The chair at the, yeah. the time, yeah. And um, so I taught, oh gosh, what did I teach over there? Um, I think it was an introductory. But you had, def- you had no teaching experience at that point. I th- think that's correct, yes. And, and you sent a resume, and I mean, you certainly yeah. had some good credits. I mean, HBO, I mean, I saw the same resume, or right. minus DePaul. I mean, you had DePaul and the resume I saw, but, you know, that's, you had good credits, but, you know, you hadn't taught. You don't right. have an MFA. Right, and yeah. this is the thing, you know, um, 
not everybody's a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, there was no indication that I would be a good teacher. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there was yeah. no, there was no training. There yeah. was nothing it's, like that. I'd been in school a lot, yeah. but so what, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I think a, a real problem is there's not enough teacher training. Right. I, in fact, it, it, you know, I, I talk about this in one of these, you know, intros. I talk, say that, you know, I, my first teaching gig was I was handed a syllabus that had mistakes in it. Right. And told to buy the textbook and you'll figure it out. Right. And that was it. Right. You know, I mean, so anyway, back to you. What? Uh, so it's, um, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And it's, um, it, it's strange in a way that, you know, because I don't know many jobs where, you know, you yeah. can just go there and just. <laughs> There's a handbook or yeah. something, you know. Right. <laughs> um, so, but it, it seemed to go well, but I'm, I'm sure I made all kinds of mistakes because I was teaching the way that I had been taught, mm -hmm. you know. And I started, what I really liked when I came to Tribeca was the project-oriented nature yeah. of the classes. Yeah. And that was uh, unusual and it was hard to get used to at first. And, um, but now I'm of the belief that a lot of lecture classes at universities could really be turned into something a lot more yeah. by making them more project oriented. Yeah. You know, I know MBA schools do that all the yeah. time, but you they know, have to solve it, a problem. Exactly. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I think, I think two things, um, and you know this certainly of me, you know, one, it's project based mm -hmm. and, and two, it's collaborative. Right. I mean, you got to learn how to work with other people. Right. I mean, that, the world is working with other people. You right. know, you don't do it in a vacuum. You know, you have to figure it out together and solve a problem. Right, right. Um, one of the other things I love, too, is uh, even though I've been doing it, I've been at Tribeca now, I think, uh, six years going on seven, um, it's... Every class is different, mm -hmm. and even if it's with students you've had before, yeah, they're different now, and um, they will, you know, their moods change. Things happen in their lives. You know, we've got a lot of students that uh, almost all of them have to work outside of school, um, and there's, um, you know, everybody has personal lives that are up and down, mm -hmm. and so um, to be aware of that and to, you know, kind of factor that in, that's all really important. You know, um, we had one student that was showing up late every day. I was like, you know, what, wh what's going on? Well, he was driving for Uber and <laughs> he thought, oh, I'll get one more ride. And that ride ended up going out to O'Hare and he, you know, you yeah. don't say no. So you have to be aware of that. Um, and, um, you know, it's not always an excuse, but you have to be flexible enough. It, it, it's taking a sort of a humanistic approach to teaching, you know, right. you're, you're like looking at the the student as not the student, but as a person. And this is, you know, and the, the tough part of that is, you know, at some point they actually, you know, if you put them into the real world, they cannot, you know, he cannot miss, you know, his job because he's taken an Uber ride exactly. to O'Hare. Yeah. You know, so exactly. you gotta, so have a level of professionalism there. This is a question I have for you then, because it's something <laughs> that I always struggle with is, how do you decide when you take a hard line and say, no, the deadline is five yeah. o'clock today and you you were at 5.05, you missed it. Yeah. And that's the way it is. That is a hard one. I, I mean, I, I know for me, you know, it's situational, right. you know, and, 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 you know, at some point, you, you know, you, it builds up over the course of the semester or even semesters, if you've had the same student and you know, when they're pulling the wool over your yep. eyes or there was a legitimate problem. But I think if you've set it up in a way that, you know, systematically they've said, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, stuck in traffic. I'm going to be there at nine 15 as opposed to nine, you know, you know, that kind of student, Hey, you know, I'm slammed with a midterm from this other class. Can I turn this thing in later? Right. Or can I turn this in now and then keep working on it? And give, you know, you see that kind of student. And if they say, you know, I, I missed the deadline, but I'll get it to you by six o'clock tomorrow. They've got some credibility. Right, right. But if <clears throat> if they don't have that, you know, if they've like just never shown up, never talked, they don't have that. It, it's totally situational. Right, right. And that's really hard. But but again, that's where I think teacher training comes in. Like, you know, you have to sort of sit there and, or, and even teacher training can be just bringing a group of teachers together and like, talk about these issues. Right. What happened? What, what, you know, how do we work this out? And also we're working in the arts, you know, the arts, there's not a right or wrong answer. You know, it's, it's, it's like, I, I say all the time, you know, you know, I looked out my office there and there was the Picasso statue. And then right down the street was, you know, Monet's haystacks. Who's the better artist? Right. You know, right. Picasso and Monet. I mean, it's like, you can't, it's sub totally subjective. And, but what you do know is if they've put in the effort, if Picasso right. put in the effort and Monet put in the effort. Absolutely. And you know, the student put in the effort. So I want to ask you about, um, cause this comes up, I hear it in the back of my head the whole time, the way a movie influences me. Uh -huh. with my day-to-day -day job, the whiplash. <laughs> um, because oftentimes I will say good job or I'll say, you know, something that he absolutely 
was dead set against. Yeah. And obviously he wasn't. The, the a, movie Whiplash. Yeah, the movie about. Whiplash. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The teacher in that movie. Yeah. Um, that's certainly not the kind of teacher I am. But, you know, the, again, I guess that's that same question of where, how hard can you be on your students and where are you really going to push the line? I'm curious what yeah. you, well, how you would answer that. that. You know, that's a good question. I, I think I am guilty of, and I use that word loosely, uh, guilty of always saying when someone presents something, well done, good job. Right. You know, even when I'm shooting film and I'm, I'm having an actor and, you know, take one go saying, oh, hey, that was great. Let's do it again. Right. <laughs> you know, right. By definition, you know, when I say that was great, let's do it again. It wasn't that great. You right. know, we think we can get something better. So I think I do that. I, right. sit, I think I sit there and say, that was good. Let's, how can we do it better? Yeah. You know, and I sort of try to, you know, you know, circle the problem right. and try to give them good, honest feedback. And the other part of it is knowing the student. At some point, I think, you know, a student, this is the best they can possibly do. Right. And the best they can possibly do is a C or a C minus and they're holding on or in some cases, hey, they're not a technical person, but they're super creative. Right. And you just have to know that person. I don't think, and I haven't really thought about this lots and lots and lots, but I don't think there is a playbook, you know, right. this is how I teach every single time, you know, uh, it's, you know, it's all di different. It's situational and things like right. that, but I, I don't know. What do you think? Um, just in talking, I think my answer would be that you make it safe for people to fail mm -hmm. and you make it, mm -hmm. you make it a non-threatening, yeah. uh, situation that also has boundaries and consequences and stakes. And yeah. actually, you, you're one of the best people that I've ever noticed to- Me? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> because um, you you have this facility of being really easygoing, um, really um, good with people, and yet at the same time, you have really hard stand or high standards. Uh, you have really high standards. And I think, um, you know, I've seen, I've been surprised sometimes where I've seen you draw a really hard line about somebody's, actions or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, it kind of surprised me. And I'm yeah. like, so, you know, not a lot of people are that flexible. I've seen them be one way or the other. Yeah. But I think that's important because if everything's good job and there's no yeah. downside, people know when you're BSing them right. or when you're not invested in some way. Well, I, you, I think you hit it. You've yeah. got to be invested. Yeah. You you can't BS. You've got to talk to them. You've got to tell them the truth. Right. Yeah. I've, I've said about acting, I've film actors, look them in the eye and tell them the truth. Right. That's, uh, listen to them and look them in the eye and tell them the truth. And, and that's what I think, you know, is really important. And I think that's really key from a teacher to student relationship. And right. it is a relationship. It isn't just one way. I'm telling you as the teacher, I'm telling you this stuff and I'm always right. Right. You know, it comes the other way as well. Right. Rarely will I say, you know, that's, that's horrible. That that's not good work, <laughs> but I'll, I will often say, especially if I know somebody pretty well, I'll say, really, is that the best you can do? I don't think that's the best you can do. Yeah. Uh, you know that and they, and they, yeah. and they know, it, and they, but you have to build up, um, uh, a, a lot of goodwill beforehand. They, you've spent some time together. They know that you know that they know yeah. that they didn't yeah. do as well as so, they so could have. I think that that's the, the key thing is time, right? You know, and also I think it's really hard if you, one is an adjunct because your time is only those two hours you're with the student a day or a week or whatever. And and if you're really dedicated, you 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 know follow up an email and you're open to them and they can give you responses but sometimes the job of the adjunct is just different i right. mean you uh, you're hard. also you know or you're adjuncting three or four other places and and it's a, it's a mess but it really it's should be slowed down and and college teaching in the arts is just crazy because like you know they're they're not going to be good yet at 21 you right. know, they, I mean, I, the best of them are not going to be good. You know, they have to mature. They have to be able to talk. I mean, if they can't rent a car, if they can't right. go to Hertz and rent a car, but, you know, they can't really be a professional. Right. You know? the, the fun uh, for us uh, at Tribeca, of course, was seeing the students uh, go from being 19 years old to 20 or 21. And the, the change mm -hmm. in their maturity and their approach was, you know, over one summer huge. was huge. Huge. And you do start to see the people that start to dig in and they yeah. really start to, you know, blossom. That's yeah. that's great. Uh, we had one student this summer who had done a uh, internship at Hallmark in Kansas City and she came back and her reel was so much, I mean, wow. it, it blew me away. It was just, and her work is uh, taking a huge leap. That's great. And so it's always nice to, to see that. Um, uh, we have some, uh, I was talking earlier about some of the more advanced students I have in one of my classes and they're, 
there's a, a cockiness they have now that is nice because they know that they can do certain <laughs> yeah, things. Yeah, sure. Right. They've been through it enough times now. And that's one thing we really do well at school is we put them through production over and over and yeah. over again. You, you fail fast. Yeah. You know, that, that concept of failing fast where, right. you know, you make a mistake, you learn from that mistake, you get over it and you do another one. You right. Know? I think that's really important. And I think the other thing that's really important was the shift down at Tribeca from a two-year program to a four-year program. Right. Because the thing we said over and over and over again is we need more time. Right. And, and, and you can't do that if, you know, in two years, you know, they're out. Right. They're, they're done. And, and, and in some cases, they're still 19 years old. Right. You know, you just need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And they can do that for five more years probably right. in their lives. Yeah, it was funny. I just finished up a screenwriting class and these are first year students. So some of them are, you know, <clears throat> right. Many of them are right out of high school, you know, 18, maybe 19. And um, the whole idea of doing multiple drafts of the same script was like, so, okay, so we're going to do draft two. Now, this is a different script now. And I was like, no, it's the same script. Well, well I just wrote that. And, like, <laughs> and it was it was really funny to see that this was a foreign concept, that you would actually rewrite something to wait, and even a third time. The, what they did see, though, was the value of the table reads. They uh -huh, loved that. Sure. And every one of those scripts got better. And by the third draft, we weren't talking about formatting anymore. We yeah. were talking about theme, and we were talking about motivation, and we were talking about nuances yeah. of what are the objects that are on the table that show the character and, yeah. you know, um, so it, that was nice to see. Yeah. So, so, so as we wrap up here, a couple yeah. of other questions, um, as a teacher, any highlights just for like t teaching career, like moments that, you know, just sort of shined or sparkled? Wow. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's hard to, it, I would just say it's kind of this generic moment when you see somebody really get it and it clicks and they really, you yeah. know, uh, are enjoying themselves. And, you and know, grow. You yeah. see growth. Like in front of you, you yes. see this person grow up. And I figured something that you see them th go, I figured something out. I know to do something exactly. I didn't know yesterday. And I can repeat it over and yeah. over and over again. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, yeah. any teacher at any grade level will probably tell you that. So that's that's a lot of fun because it feels like you, you know, you actually had an effect in a positive way uh, for somebody. Um, I really like working with uh, my colleagues. Uh, we've got a really good group and, um, you know, sometimes we're asked to do a lot and we've, um, you know, constantly changing landscapes. So that's uh, that's really fun and, and makes... Uh, yeah, it's not for work. everybody, like, though. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, 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 the constant, constantly changing landscape, right. you know, we're on semesters, we're on quarters, we're a two-year program, we're a four-year program, we're right. online. I mean, I was there. I mean, it's, it's challenging for a lot of people, but it's also it's, thrilling. yeah. And it's um, – we're back to three-hour classes now, so mm -hmm. now we have to get reoriented to that. But um, the, the biggest problem for me doing that was you would just be getting a class to a point where it was really good. And then it and stopped. You, yeah, and then yeah. you had to change it yeah. to half the time yeah. or double the time or yeah. whatever. So um, uh, I think the screenings are always big moments uh -huh. um, where students really enjoy seeing their work on the big screen. Uh -huh. Or they're terrified <laughs> and they realize, oh, my God, I sh really should have put more work into this. And now everybody's going to see. Yeah, yeah. And so why you got to do it. But man. The, yeah. they, you know, the pain is is very, very valuable. It, I went through the same thing. It, it's not a film until you show it to people. Right. If, if you just make it and put it in your own box and no one sees it, it's not a film. Right. It's a thing you did that no one you share. It's, right. it's You've got to complete that circle. I agree. Right. So um, two more things. Sure. Uh, any disappointments as a teacher? Like, I mean, I know, I I know some, for me, I, I've had these moments where, God, that class just wasn't good. And then sometimes I think, is it me? Some, mostly I think it's them. <laughs> yeah. So like, you, like one class period that just. No, you didn't... A, a course. Yeah. You know, a course, like I, you know, just, it was a bad mix. It was just, I, you know, it was just not a good mix, me and them. It just didn't work. Yeah. That's a disappointment. Um, there was a class recently where I, I actually allowed myself to get frustrated and show it. And, um, but it was because people were not trying. Yes. And Ugh. for some reason there was a, this kind of, um, it was in the room where even people that I knew were hard workers, there something was happening and I was, I was mad at them, but I was also thinking, what am I not yeah. providing that, yeah. you know? Um, I think and, that happens to teachers. I think it's just, you know, you get the same group of students, you're doing the same thing, you're exactly. the same you, and then suddenly something happens. And it's sometimes it could be uh, uh, something happens environmentally. I noticed a lot after uh, our current president was elected 
there was just a whole bunch of negativity. Oh yeah. Right for the next school year. Yeah. You know, and like, and it was, it, well, you know, it happened outside of school. It happened all over the place. And I think that that happens and it gets, seeps into the class. Yeah. I also think it happens when you're overwhelmed and things like that. But then there are these other reasons like, why, why isn't this working? This right. always works and it's not working. Right, right. You know? So um, I think that that's the, the toughest part is when people just uh, don't, uh, you know, you don't have to be killing yourself necessarily, but you you want it to be there. Yeah. I want to help you get your money's worth, and I want to help you grow as much as you can. And you know, if it's um, you know an ongoing problem, you know, you've got to find some sort of solution. But so that was the most I think frustrating thing. But it's funny too because um, this is the first week of classes, and I've heard multiple people that are teaching talk about how um, they're not up to speed yet. And they're, you know, you know, it's the typical first <laughs> yeah, week yeah, yeah. and just they're not doing a good job, you know, and they're sort of, you know, doubting themselves that way. And that's mm. that's why it's important to have colleagues. That's what makes it hard as an adjunct that- Yeah, you don't have that feedback. Right, yeah. Exactly, right. Yeah. I, I think for me, a thing that really bothers me with students is when you see that the teacher, you, me, whomever, cares more than the student does. Right. And if I'm killing myself for the student and they just don't care, that's their problem. Right. <laughs> yeah, I hate to say it. It's their problem. Yeah. That's a, that's a real tough thing. It doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, you know, it's it's disappointing to me. Yeah. I also I, I also think that we forget how much longer we've been doing this yeah. than they have. And so they may not see the value. Yeah. They may yeah. not have learned, you know, good work habits or whatever. And so- um, I think that's, that's very part of generous, it. but I think you're right. It's also a maturity thing. Yeah, you know, you're 20. I mean, it, you said you said earlier you were immature. I don't believe it, but yeah. you were immature when you were at that age. But no, they are. I mean, there's a like knowing how to put the time in and be there over and over. Yeah, that, right. that's a very real thing. Right. So, so one one more thing we sure. haven't talked about it. Um, I always believe, and I think you know this, that that to be a good teacher in the arts, you also have to be a practitioner, mm -hmm. right? You have to right. be working and doing it. Right. And you were making a film yes. or have been making a film for quite some time. Many years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us about the film and, and, and what's, you know, it's about teaching. Right. It's about teachers. It's not about teaching. It's about teachers. Right. It's and, called, okay, go ahead. No. It's called The Public School Wars. And um, it is the story of uh, the evolution and the, uh, kind of the efforts to reform public education in the United States. And um, there are many competing interests, um, one of which is kind of the traditional school system. Um, and then there are, uh, for example, charter schools that are um, kind of a quasi, they, they call themselves public, but there's uh, private elements to it. And um, there's been um, a, a lot of contentious debate about that. And um, there's just so many aspects to this. That's just one small part of it. But what I found is there's so many aspects to the public school wars that it's – and it's such a huge project. It, that has been one of the big challenges is, hmm. you know, what is the story that you're telling? It is huge, telling? yeah. Yeah. And so ultimately I think for me it's going to end up being an overview of the issues that are out there along with some stories of people that are fighting the battles mm -hmm. on the front lines. Um, and hopefully it will hold some interest. Yeah, uh, I, I saw it, it does hold yeah. interest. It's an important issue. Yeah, and uh, but as you know, when you've seen your footage for so long, over so <laughs> many years, it's like, um, you know, you go through these cycles and of uh, loving it and thinking it's the best and uh, being sick of it. And that's actually one of the things we teach our students all the time. It feels normal to hate doing the work on this and it feels normal to be really excited about it and you will go through that multiple times yeah. on most projects well you know i saw a cut and i really liked it i mean you know my feedback on it right you know what what uh, when might it be done well i'm i'm <laughs> What's really left? hoping uh sometime in march i mean it really uh i just did an inter one last interview last week i've got two more that i feel like i need to do to fill out one of the stories about the uh, diet hunger strike that mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. um in uh, 2015 i believe it was uh the saving uh diet high school um, and, um, so I'll do a couple more interviews on that. Um, and, um, but then, you know, you've got to do the, uh, the audio mixing and the, and I'm taking to heart your, uh, suggestion that we do a narration of some, uh, -huh. uh sort. So I'm working on that as well. So pick a, pick a date and, and be done by graduation. Yes, or <laughs> exactly. So, um, 
and uh, it helps in some ways to be a perfectionist and it hurts in other ways. Sure. So, um, you know, to have a certain high standard. And also the other tough thing is this is a, you know, in one aspect of it, it's a traditional 90 minute documentary. And that is in many ways, not a form that, uh, although it's more popular than ever, um, one of the problems that Mark Marin said, enough with documentaries already, you know, we've got enough. Um, it's, it's a, you know, there are so many different forms now and, and lengths, you know, to get, ask somebody to spend 90 minutes yeah. on a subject. I really want to make it, you know, worth their while. So, well, I'm sure you will. And, mm. and, you know, you know, I say this and we said it at the start and mm. I wrapping it up like yeah. a professional. There you go. Does, uh, you know, Stick the, that landing. Yeah. <laughs> the thousand true fans, yeah. you know, there are clearly enough people that really care about the issues in education today that, you know, you tell a lot of interesting stories. You're all over the country. You're in California, you're in DC, you're in New York, you're in Chicago. Seattle. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, people will be interested. And I think if you build on the thousand true fans you have and then build from there, you're going to find an audience for sure. I mean, it may be an, a, an untraditional distribution method. I mean, it may be film festivals, it may be PBS, but it could be websites, it could be streaming, it sure. could be, I think it does, would do great at, you know, one-off screenings with you in person at various places. Right, right. You know? Um, and it's it's really nice. And one of the, the best uh, things that I've discovered during this is there are so many teachers that care so much about Teaching. Kids out there, yeah, yeah. yeah, and 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 they, I mean, almost to a fault, will uh, devote energy and time uh, to help students, and um, you know more so than you know. I mean, it's just more so than I think I could, yeah. you know, if I was teaching elementary school. Jeez. So there's there's how do you do that? Uh, <laughs> there are so many heroes. Well, I got like six year olds. <laughs> my my sister in law has been teaching, I think, close to thirty years now in Chicago public school. She's hey. teaching first grade now, and she said you have to teach them how to write and uh, uh, wipe their nose at the same time, you know, <laughs> teach them to do math and tie their shoes at the same time. Um, and so that's, that's uh, there's a lot of heroic people out there doing that work. And they're, and they're under a lot of pressure from a lot of different interests. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to see the, uh, the, the way they're fighting back. That, that's, that's, you're right on. And mm -hmm. I think that's a great place to end. I mean, you know, I mean, my image now is uh, teaching them to write and wipe their nose at the same time. But, you know, I'm glad we don't have to do that. But I'm glad you're making this film. And thank you for coming over here and talking to me. And, uh, you know, hopefully we didn't stink too bad. No, no. Can I add one last thing? Please. Some of the best advice I ever got in teaching uh -huh. was from somebody I used to work with that's sitting across the table <laughs> from me right now. And you said, don't fuck up. And, <laughs> and what I loved about that was... In three words, that was three words, right? In uh -huh. three words, you said, I trust you. I uh, trust that you're going to do a good job. And if you don't, uh, I'll probably have your back, but there's going to be consequences. <laughs> and I, I think that's fantastic advice uh, succinctly stated. So so thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, it changed the name of this thing to Don't Fuck Up. I, <laughs> You can have it for free. I, yes. You know what? I'm telling you, that's yeah. the, I've told students forever and ever and ever, there's one bit of advice I'm going to give a film student is that. Because right. if you don't fuck up, you're going to be pro totally fine. Right. Remember Chelsea Morin, the student Chelsea sure. Morin? Yeah. Sure. So I told her that and she laughed. I said, no, I'm serious. And she said, are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm serious. And she, I said, it's a perfect rule. Right. And so we were with a group of people one time and I said, just turned to her and I said, Chelsea, what's my rule of... Uh, of, of filmmaking and she just looks real sheep and he goes don't fuck up <laughs> I said yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right yeah. yes so yes thank you that's a good rule for teachers too there you go alright man thanks thank you cool thanks right. for having me so that's it it's a wrap as they say in the film business my thanks to Bill Bacon for stopping by to chat thanks to Andrew Shabat at Soundmaker Post for his production and music help and thank you all for listening come on back now it's time for me to get a drink mm -hmm.